And on my property, milkweeds are a problem. Uh, we have antelope horn milkweed primarily up there. And when I see milkweed becoming common in our pastures and rangeland, I kill it. Um, the, the thing with milkweeds is that they, they can poison livestock, especially beef cattle. And uh, we don't need any cows getting sick or dying because they consume some of this stuff. So I, I kill it. I consider it a weed. Uh, a lot of folks don't. And outside of a, a livestock production operation, I, I probably wouldn't either. Uh, we know the milkweeds serve as a, you know, one of the primary uh, food sources for monarch butterfly and, and a lot of other pollinators. And so, uh, you know, it, it really depends on your goals. My neighbors right across the fence, uh, they don't have cattle. And so they don't mind having milkweed. They, they primarily are interested in wildlife and uh, kind of ecotourism, and that's okay. But on my side of the fence, a milkweed is a problem. It's a weed for me. Uh, my wife likes to take these pictures of the flowers just before I sneak out and, and kill them on our property, but she, she also enjoys them just because they're pretty. Uh, nothing wrong with that. So again, the definition of weed is a little shady depending on who you are and what side of the fence you're on. If you look at the most problematic weed species worldwide, and this is actually something we do every year within uh, that discipline of science, we fill out these surveys that go uh, across the globe trying to determine what species we should be most focused on. And you see some common threads when you start looking at uh, the most successful weeds, or you could think of it as the most problematic weeds. And, and a few of those are shown here. You know, anything that establishes very quickly uh, under favorable conditions. So think of your summer annual weeds that come up really quick in the spring before it gets too hot. And while we still have some decent soil moisture, uh, they get up quickly and they outcompete the surrounding vegetation. That makes them a successful weed. Uh, plants that, aren't, that are able to persist in really harsh environments where other plants can't. And I'll give you some good examples of a few of these as we go forward. Um, species that produce a large number of seed. Most of our annuals will do this. And so they get up quickly, they flower, they make a bunch of seed and then they die. And at that point, we're not worried about that plant anymore. We're worried about all that seed it just put into our field or a yard or a garden that's gonna be an issue for years to come. And then plants that are able to reproduce outside of seed, okay? Reproduce through structures uh, above ground or below ground, stolons and rhizomes. So think of your Bermuda grass, your turf grass, those little creepers, those runners, those are stolons and then the ones underground are rhizomes. And they can uh, reproduce very aggressively through those structures. Uh, seed that stays viable after a long period of time, um, that can be a problem because you can clean up uh, an area free of weeds and you think you're okay, but 10 years down the road, you still have seed weeds that are coming from seed that was dormant in that soil. Uh, seeds that can transport themselves very easily on, on animals or wildlife or wind, water, what have you, those are also problems. And then there's a lelopathy, which are weeds that basically produce their own herbicide, weeds that exude chemicals into the soil around them and eliminate uh, neighboring plants. So a few good examples to think of. Um, if we're talking about plants that make a lot of seed, I can't think of a better example than what you're looking at here. These are uh, some of the more problematic species we deal with in, in, in our row crops in this area. Uh, you're looking at common water hemp there. We, we have another cousin to that one uh, in this area called Palmer amaranth. These are amaranthus type weeds and uh, they're an issue for a couple of reasons. Number one, they, they tend to be really diverse and so we've seen some of the biggest issues with herbicide resistance coming about in these species but also uh, they produce a lot of seed. They're a summer annual uh, one of those plants out there, if it were well watered, could go on to make hundreds of thousands of seed. And we've seen some go over a million seed per plant. And so if you have a, an issue out there and you have some weed escapes in your field, uh, it doesn't take very many before they start to become a real problem and that issue snowballs. So if I've got 100 plants out there that all make 100,000 seed, uh, you can see you know, the exponential growth you see in these populations and in some of the fields around this area. 
few other, you know, common uh, annuals that, that produce a lot of seed. You can see crabgrass on the list there. Uh, pretty easy for crabgrass to make, uh, you know, tens of thousands of seed. Uh, and at the bottom of the list, that uh, annual bluegrass or poa annua that we get in our yards during the winter time, those little tufts of annual bluegrass can still give you a couple thousand seeds. So it doesn't take very many of those plants in your yard uh, to become a big problem if you allow them to reproduce. I mentioned weeds that can persist in really harsh environments, and I can't think of a better example than sandbar. Um, we deal with sandbar primarily on the pasture and hayfield side of, of things because uh, obviously those birds are a problem when livestock ingest them. They don't like the feel of those in their mouths. They can also cause mechanical damage in their uh, esophagus and, and you know, digestive tract. And so we have a lot of issues with sandbur. The trouble with sandbur is, uh, as you would probably guess, it actually grows okay on sandy soils where nothing else really grows well. Uh, so it persists in that really harsh environment where you have well-drained soils that dry out very quickly after a rain. Uh, they become droughty very quickly. Um, but for some reason, sand burr can hang in there on those sides. And what we found is that that, that burr, uh, which actually contains the seed, typically two seed per burr or per capsule, that burr surrounds the seed in the soil and provides it kind of a sponge for moisture in that sandy soil. And there's also oftentimes some kind of beneficial microbe or bacteria species inside that burr as well. So you have this burr that provides that seed with this favorable microclimate and allows it to hang in there on a sandy, dry soil and persist when other plants can't. We mentioned reproductive structures uh, outside of seed production. So uh, one of the, the biggest issues we have globally uh, are with these nut sedge species. This is yellow nut sedge. There's also purple nut sedge. Uh, and the problem with them is they can reproduce very aggressively through rhizomes and also these uh, almost like a tuber that you see in that bottom right photo. And so it's not enough just to kill the plant that you see above ground, but you have to kill what's below ground as well because those structures can then sprout and produce additional plants and you get these really large colonies of nut sedge because of those tubers and because of those rhizomes. Cocklebur is a, a good example of a couple of the things we talked about. So uh, we have a lot of cattle uh, that come from my neighbor's place, uh, some distant family in Llano County, and they tend to bring cocklebur with them. They, they stay basically from August through January during deer season at our neighbor's place they bring cockleburr over when we bring them back after New Year's because those burr get hung up in their hide. So they transport easily on wildlife and on livestock and they fall off occasionally on our property and we wind up with cockleburr. Uh, so that's one of those criteria that we talked about. The other one is cockleburr seed has this really goofy dormancy mechanism. And so th those burrs that you see in my hand uh, in that photo, uh, just like sandbird, that's actually a capsule around the seed. That's not the seed itself. So inside of that capsule, usually there's two seed. There's a small seed and a big seed. The small seed is very germinable. And uh, typically that's going to come up the following season after it was produced or maybe two years down the road. The large seed has a dormancy mechanism built into it though. So the large seed might sit there for five years or 10 years or 20 years and then Finally, when it receives some signal, uh, temperature, moisture, time, what have you, it will come up and, and become a problem then. So it has these really strange dormancy mechanisms built into it. So I could eradicate cockleburr from our property and clean the cows before they come back every year, but I would still have a cockleburr problem for many years to come because I have a lot of that really dormant seed sitting there in the soil just waiting. Uh, and it's really hard to, to manage a species like that. Other transport mechanisms that, that we create, of course, are you know, things like equipment. Uh, I deal with this a lot in the row crop world where we have uh, combines and, and cotton pickers traveling all over the country, depending on where the harvest is at time of year. And we have a lot of uh, seed being transported on that equipment, little tiny seed like pigweed or careless weed seed, uh, even our mower decks, 
uh, shredder decks, things like that can hold a lot of debris, which usually contains some weed seed. We also deal with a lot of uh, new and exciting weed issues after droughty periods of time in Texas. Uh, the 2011 drought was a prime example where we had basically zero um, baled hay left in the state of Texas because we had a statewide drought and people from all over the nation were sending bales of hay to Texas to help the livestock producers here. The trouble is a lot of those bales of hay had a lot of weed seed in them and so we've dealt with the fallout of that ever since. Uh, where we've had all these invasive species of different types and varieties that came to the state um, under good intentions, but unfortunately uh, hitched a ride with the hay that came to us. When it comes to identifying weeds, uh, there's a lot of ways you can go about this. Um, I've got a bookshelf in the corner here that's just full of, of resources. You know, you can go as extreme as using a full plant key. Uh, I've got a couple here. Um, they're useful if you really want to put a lot of time and effort into identifying a plant. Uh, but a lot of times where I can't find an easy answer, I have to resort to a plant key and they're pretty boring to go through. Uh, at best, they have some line drawings in them, kind of like you see on the, the yellow book cover there. Uh, but usually they require a microscope, especially in the case of grasses. Uh, you, you need a microscope and you really need to be an expert on grasses anyways to, to identify many of them. Um, I like pictures myself. I like books that have a lot of photos. Uh, I've got a couple on my shelf arranging pasture weeds that actually have weeds grouped by flower color. It's not the most scientific way to do it, but it's really a, an easy way to uh, go about identifying plants. So if I have something with a purple flower, I'm going to look in the purple section of the book and see if I can find something that matches. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I'm not native to South Texas. I come from West Texas. Um, been down here a little while, but I still don't know a lot of the weeds that folks bring into the office here. And uh, on this slide, I've got a couple of the most useful guides that I've found um, that have helped me out a lot. These are both from Texas Tech Press, and I think they're both still in print. I know last year you were still able to find them. I haven't looked for them recently. Um, the first one is a field guide to the broadleaf herbaceous plants of South Texas, so strictly dicot or broadleaf species. Uh, the second one, uh, weeds in South Texas and Northern Mexico also includes grasses as well. Um, so these are going to give you, you know, for me at least, nine times out of ten, I can find um, things that come by the office. I can find them in those two books. Um, most of the really common weeds that make up, you know, 80% of what we tend to find in this area. Both of those are really useful. Um, I've gotten a lot of uh, value out of both of those guides. When you're looking at these weed ID guides or just plant ID keys in general, you've got to know a lot of very specific terms for different parts of plant anatomy. And I know I went through a couple of taxonomy courses and, and we learned all that stuff ad nauseum in the years since then, I've forgotten most of those terms. So when I'm going through a, a, a plant ID guide or a key and they tell me, okay, does this one have cuneate leaves or obvo, obvobate leaves? I don't know what that means off the top of my head most of the time. So uh, you can Google those terms. You know, there's a lot of different ways to describe leaf shape um, beyond the, the kind of the obvious ones. Um, and so it's, it's pretty easy to figure out what those mean and, and navigate that if you have a phone or a computer nearby. Uh, but leaf shape is one of the big ones for broadleaf weeds. Also leaf margins. Um, you know, is the, the margin or the edge of the leaf, is it smooth or is it serrated or dentate um, or crenate? There's all these different terms to describe those edges of the leaf, but those are really important um, identifying characteristics. Also leaf tips. Um, does it come to an accumulate tip? I, I see that one a lot. Does it come to a, a little narrow pointy tip at the end of a rounded off leaf? Um, those are important things to look at. Mucronate is another one. Does it have kind of a rounded tip, but then a little hair that comes off of the, the tip of that leaf? One of the big characteristics is the leaf arrangement. Okay, if you look at the stem of a plant or a branch of a, of a you know, woody plant, look at the, the branching arrangement coming off of that main stem. Do the leaves come off alternately as you move from the base of the stem up 
Do they come up, uh, come off in an opposite manner where you have two branches on either side of the stem, uh, or you could have world arrangements where you have multiple leaf attachment points, uh, more than two at each node of the plant. That's a very, very important characteristic and one of the first ones you need to look for when you're trying to identify something. Um, ideally, we like to have uh, flowers, uh, flowering structures or inflorescences present on a plant to identify them, especially with grasses. Um, you know, if a, if a weed comes into the office and I don't have a flower to go off of, if I don't know it by sight, it's going to be hard to identify it. Uh, but when we have a flower there, we can key a plant out all the way because the flower tells you a lot. The flower color, the number of petals, uh, whether it has all the male and female parts or only one, that's very important. And then also the structure of the inflorescence, the, the flowering arrangement on the plant tells you quite a bit. Grasses are very difficult. Um, you know, there, there's... <laughs> There's a couple of people in the A&M system that can identify grasses very well. Uh, the rest of us are just marginal at best. Uh, I know a lot of grasses by sight because I deal with them on a regular basis, but outside of that, I don't know, 20 or 30 species, uh, I have a tough time identifying grasses. If you have a, a seed head formed or an inflorescence formed, it, it's much easier. But if there's no seed head, there's very few people in the state that can identify a grass uh, solely on vegetative uh, structures. So they're really difficult. Um, we, we like to have the seed head. One of the, the main characteristics that we look for um, beyond the seed head itself is actually called a ligule. Um, so if you look at the leaves coming off of the stem on that kind of uh, model grass plant that we have there. So you have a leaf blade, it meets the stem, and then you have the leaf sheath that wraps around the stem. If you pull the blade away from the stem, uh, many times there's a little structure there called a ligule. That ligule in the shape and size and, and appearance of that tells us a lot about grasses. Um, so if you start looking at grass keys, you're going to see a lot on the inflorescence. You're going to see a lot of uh, identifications made on the, the ligule itself and whether or not it has one and what shape and what have you. So one of the main things we can do is just try to narrow down, um, you know, when we get a, a kind of a blind ID, do we have a grass, do we have a broadleaf, or do we have a sedge? So grasses and sedges are monocot species. When they first emerge from the soil, you see one leaf type structure, mono, right, one. With broadleaf weeds, we call those dicots. Dicots, when they emerge from the soil, they have two seedling leaves or two cotyledons. Um, very different directions that we would take in a plant key from that point there, there on. So we, we really need to start with figuring out, do we have a grass, a broadleaf, or a sedge? Uh, you can see some of the, you know, main characteristics of those, but I'll, I'll move forward and just go into some of these uh, kind of examples for you. So do we have grass, broadleaf, or sedge? If we're looking at seedlings, like I said, when the monocot, which would be a grass or a sedge, when it emerges from the soil, you have a basically a single seedling leaf that, that first comes up. And so if you look on the left-hand photo, you can see those. Now, at this point, it would be very difficult for me to say if that's a grass or a sedge, okay? But I at least know it's a monocot. Uh, we know it's not a broadleaf weed at that point. If you look over on the right-hand photo in that yellow circle, we have a couple of little weed seedlings coming up. And you can see they both have two cotyledons or two seedling leaves. So we know that's a dicot, it's a broadleaf plant. It could be a tree, it could be a bush, it could be a little herbaceous plant that uh, never gets bigger than two inches. We don't necessarily know at this point, but we at least know it's a broadleaf weed. Uh, and that's actually common water hemp. I, I know because I took the photo, but otherwise I wouldn't be able to tell you that. Uh, then we let those, those cotyledon stage uh, seedlings develop a little further, they'll start to put on true leaves. And so at the seedling stage, we can start to tell a few things. Um, with the dicots, you can see the, the true leaves coming off of that initial you know, cotyledon stage seedling. So the cotyledons are those two kind of egg-shaped leaf structures. The true leaves are what's emerging since then. So these are three lobed uh, leaves with palmate venation. 
your sed, or let's skip over, let's go to the grass over on the right hand side. Uh, you can see we started with one shoot. Now we have an additional leaf here. Um, typically with grasses, our leaves are two ranked. So we have one coming off of the right side of the stem, one off the left side of the stem. Um, when you see that, you know you're dealing with a grass. Whereas the sedges typically have um, their leaves coming off in ranks of three, kind of whirled around the stem. The other thing we'll see in a second is they also have a different cross section to that stem. Um, your sedges also at that seedling stage, most of them are actually fairly rigid. If you've ever planted underneath uh, a plastic cover or put transplants into a plastic cover, if you have sedges, they'll come right through that plastic, whereas a grass typically can't do that. Uh, sedges will penetrate that and, and emerge just fine. If you cut the stem uh, crossways and look at the cross section, that will tell you a few things. Uh, your broadleaf weeds, by and large, have round cross sections to the stem. Grasses, most of the time, will be flattened, uh, although there are a few that'll just be strictly round. But in that seedling stage, usually they're kind of a flattened shape. And your sedges over on the right hand side, they're triangular in cross section. So the easy way to remember that is sedges have edges. So if you roll that stem uh, between your fingers, you'll be able to fill those edges on a triangular stem very easily. Um, one of the key characteristics of sedge. Uh, leaf veination would be the next thing to think about. In your broadleaf species, we can have a lot of different patterns of veination. Uh, you can see this kind of palmate or netted leaf veination in the upper uh, left of that broadleaf weed, whereas in your grasses and your sedges, the veins in the leaf are all parallel, kind of a linear shaped, long, narrow leaf with parallel veins. Leaf shape uh, is another characteristic. So in the broadleaf world, there's any and all leaf shapes available. Um, you know, I, I showed you that that diagram earlier where we had, I don't know, 20 or 30 different leaf shapes on that one slide. Uh, so there's a lot of diversity in the broadleaf world, like you see in the uh, upper left. In sedges or grasses, typically you're going to have pretty simple leaves, very long, narrow. Um, you know, sometimes the leaf tip could be an identifying characteristic. We use that in sedges sometimes, uh, but you don't see a lot of variation in those worlds. And then remember leaf arrangement, that's important. Uh, again, if you're trying to differentiate between a grass or a sedge, that does tell you something. So if you have that two ranked uh, or you know, basically alternate moving up the stem in ranks of two, uh, those are grasses like you see on the left hand side. Whereas as your sedges, especially as they become bigger and more mature, you can really easily see that they're ranked in threes around the stem. So from each of those flat sides of the triangular stem, you'll typically have a leaf that comes off of there. Again, inflorescences are by far the, the best way to identify a plant. Uh, there's enough diversity out there um, that, and there's enough characteristics on a flower that we can, we can use a plant key uh, 90 times out of 100 to identify a plant based on the flower alone. A lot of diversity in your broadleaf weeds. Typically, they're very showy, a lot of different colors to look at. Grasses are a little more boring. Um, I know some folks would probably argue with me on that, but typically you don't have showy inflorescences on grasses. There's a lot going on in those little seed heads that we see in the photos, uh, but you need a microscope to see it. Uh, in the, the sedge world, in the upper right set of photos, uh, typically you have these kind of flattened uh, spike inflorescences. Uh, you see yellow nut sedge over on the, the far left side. We have uh, looks like a green flat sedge over on the right. Uh, there is a little variation in the sedge world, uh, but they tend to all have that same inflorescence structure. So one of the main things we want to do when we identify a weed species, uh, we need to figure out whether it's an annual or perennial. So once we identify it, we're going to read the characteristics of that plant, we need to find out, is this thing going to be a problem just this year or is it going to be an issue for years to come? And that tells us a lot about how we need to manage that problem. Um, if it's an annual, we have a pretty simple life strategy. So your annuals are going to come up during the 
easiest time of the year. So your summer annuals are going to come up in the spring. Your winter annuals are going to come up around here, uh, you know, November, December, somewhere in there before it gets properly cold. So they come up under good conditions. Uh, they set flower very quickly and then they produce seed. And so they're going to make a lot of seed. Typically, if we look at annuals versus perennials, just as broad groups, annuals produce much more seed than a perennial will. They're putting all their energy into that seed production. So they're not developing a big extensive root system. Okay, so if we can control the top of the plant, we can kill an annual, right? We're not worried about the root coming back. Um, they just don't have the resources to do that. So everything we do when we're dealing with an annual weed is centered around preventing that plant from flowering and setting seed. So we wanna get after them quick, kill them early in the year before they compete much with our desirable plants, prevent them from making seed. If we let one of those pigweeds go in the garden, we just went from having one plant to now having maybe 10,000 to deal with next year, right? So we wanna kill that plant before it becomes that, that bigger issue. Uh, perennials though are gonna be a little more tricky, uh, especially where we're relying on mechanical control like hand hoeing or herbicidal control that dictates how we need to go about those methods because the perennial is going to have more reproductive capacity. It's going to have things below ground, uh, stolons, rhizomes, tubers, bulbs, what have you. So if we're going out and we're chopping weeds, and I spent, I don't know, two or three hours today doing that in one of our, our trials. Okay, I'm dealing with annual weeds. I'm not chopping very deep. I just want to take the top of the plant off and it's gone. Now, if I had a bunch of perennials out there, I would need a shovel. Okay, I've got to dig up all of that um, reproductive material below ground. You look at um, some of the brush species around here, mesquite, wesatch, things like that. If you wanted to mechanically remove one of those, you have to do a lot of dirt work. Okay, and it takes a lot of heavy equipment because we're trying to get all of that reproductive capacity out of the ground. All those buds on the root system have to come out as well. So perennials are more difficult. Um, if we're spraying a herbicide, we want to use something that will get to those below ground structures. It's not enough just to burn the leaves off above ground. We need a herbicide that will move or translocate in the plant down to those root systems, uh, down into tubers, rhizomes, what have you, and, and truly kill the plant. Uh, typically, a perennial is not going to make a tremendous amount of seed because they put a lot of um, effort, a lot of their energy into that root system. Um, so we're not as worried about seed production. We're more worried about killing what's below ground and doing so at the best time. So here's your annual examples, right? Very uh, shallow root systems. There's not a lot going on below ground. If we kill what's above ground, we're going to kill that plant entirely. Whereas your perennials are going to be a little more difficult. So if we've got these big rhizomes, these kind of white root-like root structures below ground, if we take the top of the plant off, that's going to signal these rhizomes to start activating buds. Okay, and those buds are going to come back and produce additional plants. This uh, nut sedge over on the right-hand side will do the same thing. And, and these are even more nasty because they'll put out a rhizome down to a tuber. And if it's a purple nut sedge, that tuber will then produce a rhizome and another tuber and so on and so forth. So you get these big chains or colonies of thousands of these plants. And so if we want to control that problem, we have to do something about those tubers and those rhizomes. Uh, to dig up a colony of nut sedge is going to be a lot of work. Uh, you're talking about unearthing a, a whole field, basically. Uh, we can get after them sometimes with chemicals, herbicides, uh, that will translocate to those structures and kill them. Uh, but you got to know what you're dealing with so that you know how to control it properly. And so integrated weed management, just like uh, integrated pest management in the insect world, is that method of using all of the tools available to manage the problem. Okay, uh, we tend to use herbicides um, in a lot of situations, but that doesn't mean that's the only method available to you. Herbicides are going to be more convenient in a lot of cases, but there's other things we have to do if we really want to be successful at managing weeds. And so that means 
prevention, cultural methods, biological methods, mechanical uh, methods like a hoe or a, a rototiller, things like that. And then chemical methods have their place as well. So cultural methods, basically anything that you do to create a environment that's not favorable to weed, weed growth. And so the arenas that I work with, especially in the pasture world, that means making a big, thick, dense stand of grass. If I've got uh, calf high grass and it's just solid and we've got plenty of rain, plenty of fertilizer, good, healthy grass, we tend not to have weed problems in those pastures. And the pastures that weren't fertilized right or maybe they're droughty, um, the grass isn't growing as vigorously, we have a lot of bare ground, that means we're creating opportunities for weeds to come in and, and dominate that area. Same thing would be true in a garden. Uh, bare soil is just asking for a weed problem. Okay, we need something covering that soil, ideally uh, something we like to look at if it's around the house. Um, you know, sometimes we'll use things like, uh, you know, black plastic, stuff like that. Uh, and horticultural crops. Um, we want something to shade out those opportunities. In your turf grass, that would be growing the thickest, healthiest uh, stand of turf grass you can find um, so that we don't have to deal with weed issues. We don't want to create opportunities for weeds to come in and, and uh, invade a site. Prevention is worth a lot. Um, going to back to something I mentioned earlier about bringing in contaminated hay to the state of Texas. Well, that, that falls into this box. Um, bringing in weeds in poor quality seed is something we run into quite a bit. Cheap seed a lot of times is cheap for a reason. It might be poor seed, poor quality, poor germination, but a lot of times it also means there's contamination there. Um, we've dealt with this a uh, number of times um, in, in the pasture world where we have new weed problems that come in with cheap seed. So we want to prevent that. We want to make sure we're buying good, high quality material um, that, that's not going to have contaminants. Uh, same thing would be with topsoil, compost, mulch, especially topsoil. You need to know where that soil is coming from. Um, I got some cheap soil a few years ago to fill in a swimming pool, and it was the biggest mistake I ever made. It was creek bottom soil uh, that had all kinds of exciting weed issues in it from, you know, 80 years of being a creek bottom, and we're still dealing with weird weeds that come up in that area because I had contaminated topsoil that came in. Uh, and then lastly, sanitation of equipment. If you're sharing equipment with a neighbor, make sure both of you are, are pressure washing that material off uh, before you send it across the fence line, right? Um, little tiny weed seed doesn't, you know, need too much of an opportunity to hide on equipment and move across property lines. So wash them off before you move them off site. Biological methods uh, is an area that, that's really interesting. I, I don't know what to say about that beyond, uh, you know, there's, there's some potential there. I just haven't seen any real practical biological methods out there for controlling weeds. And it's not for a lack of trying. Uh, we get projects funded from time to time to look at different products. Uh, just haven't really seen too many things that, that have worked well. Uh, insects, um, you know, are typically going to be very specific in what they will and will not eat. Um, so there's a, you know, musk thistle weevil. Okay, it only controls musk, musk thistle, musk, excuse me, musk thistle. So if you have a, an insect that consumes a weed species, what we tend to see happen is when you release that insect, it consumes a lot of that weed, the populations in your area, but then when that weed is kind of knocked back in abundance, the pest just disappears because it doesn't have anything else to eat because they're very specific. And so it disappears and then the weeds regrow and now there's no pest and they continue on to be a problem. Um, so it's kind of tricky to work with insect methods. Um, we've used uh, in the past um, insects from the Middle East to control um, uh, its tamarisk species, uh, salt cedar in West Texas. Uh, thought we had a really good program. We released a bunch of these salt cedar beetles and we found out that one didn't just eat salt cedar. It eats another species that's closely related to salt cedar uh, and it's a species they like in Mexico and they grow for um, ornamental purposes and now that thing's wreaking havoc in Me Mexico eating uh, aethyl trees. And so uh, insects are tricky. You want one that's very specific in what it will eat because you don't want off-target problems like we had with the salt cedar beetle 
Um, but you also deal with some population dynamics issues where uh, an insect pest will eat all of the weeds and then they kind of die at that point because there's nothing else to eat. So it's a little tricky. Um, there's also been some interest in mycoherbicides. So these are microbial um, pathogens basically. Um, we've looked at a few over the years, but really, really haven't seen anything that uh, I think is going to be out and available in a, a viable form anytime soon. Mechanical methods, uh, I think are, you know, probably not the most exciting thing to talk about, but one of the most useful and one of the ones that uh, I think for the purposes of what we're talking about today that we're probably going to use the most of, right? And that's, you see a weed, you pull a weed, right? Uh, we don't need to go spray it. We don't need to think about herbicide rates and safety and what have you, if we can just go hand pull the problem or apply herbicide. Um, good heavy chopping hoe, a shovel, what have you, that takes care of a lot of weed issues. Um, I'm a little spoiled in the row crop world because we have a lot of herbicides available, so we don't have to use chopping hose too often. I'm getting a crash course in herbicide this year because we planted a bunch of hemp, uh, industrial hemp. Uh, if you know anything about hemp, you know that there's no herbicides labeled for that crop. And so we've been applying herbicide uh, about two to three hours every morning for the last five weeks trying to keep our field of hemp clean of weeds. And so it's not pretty, it's not fun, but it works. Uh, and if we keep after it long enough, I'm hoping we'll uh, manage that problem. Uh, then we can use broadcast mechanical methods. So that would be your cultivation with sweeps, knives, harrows, power tiller, things like that. Um, really effective on annual weeds. Um, very effective on perennials that are new and coming from seed established perennials, especially uh, more woody plants, that's gonna be a little more difficult. The problem I have with broadcast cultivation is that when we come in and we disturb the soil to that extent, let's say we take a, a rototiller or a power tiller out in the field, we churn that soil up, uh, we might clean that field up for the short term, but a lot of times what happens is that disturbance creates a bigger problem down the road. Okay, so we killed the weeds that were here today with a power tiller, but the next time it rains, uh, we're gonna find a lot of new weeds that we brought seed up from deeper in the soil with that piece of equipment. So broadcast cultivation is kind of tricky. It's, it's very effective, but you tend to find yourself in this downward spiral of doing it over and over and over again, because every time you do it, you generate an additional flush of weeds. Uh, mowing can be somewhat useful, um, especially in turf and pastures for weeds that tend to get a little height above your beneficial vegetation or your desirable veg vegetation, um, we can take a mower through there and we can at least keep them from producing seed, uh, make those weeds work, make them have to regrow flowers over and over again. And that's, that's helpful, but we tend to not see any true control of weeds by mowing. Um, we're not gonna kill too many weeds by doing that. Cultivation will do that though. Uh, if we can, we uproot the, the root system of the plant, we can kill them. Mowing is just kind of a temporary fix. And then the last thing here is, is chemical methods. And this is actually the one I'm gonna talk most about because we use a lot of herbicides uh, for various purposes. And it's, it's a, uh, one of the more economical, definitely one of the more convenient ways to manage a weed problem, but it has to be done right, okay? Because your herbicide is a plant uh, that by de or is a material by definition that is a plant poison, right? Uh, if we're going to use a herbicide, we want to make sure that it's safe on the plants we like and that it's effective on the plants that we don't like. Um, we can run into some really nasty problems when people apply herbicides that they don't fully understand. And I'll show you some examples here in a little bit. Um, typically, the herbicides we use are uh, synthetically derived, okay, made in a factory, what have you. There are also some natural products out there. Um, we've done a little bit of work with, with some of these, uh, not had a lot of success, but, you know, corn gluten meal, mustard seed meal, um, you know, there's a little data out there that shows there's some, some limited uses for those. Uh, some of these home remedy so, uh, solutions with vinegar, those can actually work okay, um, just as a simple burning solution to burn the leaves off of certain weeds. Um, 
not as effective as some of the, the herbicides you can get off the shelf though. Uh, here's a trial a few years back. Uh, this is actually from my former boss. This is Paul Ballman. He was our state weed specialist in College Station, uh, looking at corn gluten meal. And uh, they were interested in crabgrass and barnyard grass control and really didn't see a lot of promise in that. Um, here they're comparing it to pendimethalin, which that would be basically pendulum herbicide that you may have used in your lawns before. Um, oh, wait, 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 wait. Corn gluten meal is supposed to be a pre-emergent. Correct. That's how we're using it in this, this trial. So we're, we're using okay. these all as, as strictly pre-emerge compared with pendimethalin. Pendimethalin is a pre-emerge herbicide. And so we're looking at emergence or, or density actually uh, after the fact and even going up to a, a 3x rate of what was recommended, really not seeing any appreciable control of either of those two, spe uh, two species there. Um, a 1x rate would be what you see on the bottom, 20 pounds of corn gluten meal per thousand square foot. Uh, so at best, we're getting 16, almost 17% control of barnyard grass versus 70 plus percent control with pendimethalin. And what was really interesting about that study uh, was <laughs> When we got into that really high rate, and you would think more herbicide, or in this case, more corn gluten meal, would be better weed control. And what we actually saw, and you, you probably saw it in the data there on the previous slide, is that the best weed control from corn gluten meal was actually with the lowest rate. Um, it didn't shake out statistically, but that's what the numerical trend was. At the highest rate, at the 3x rate, look at the treated area there it's actually greener than the non-treated or untreated check. And so what we tended to see with corn gluten meal is if you put too much out there, you actually fertilize the weeds more than you kill them. Um, there might be something to it at that 20 pound per thousand square foot rate, but it, it was very weak. But at the high rates, we actually had more healthy weed growth, uh, darker foliage, more aggressive growth because there was something leaching out of that corn gluten meal that was fertilizing those plots. We also looked at mustard seed meal, um, 2013, 2014, somewhere in there. Um, that was an interesting one. Uh, you know, we, we deal with this a lot with not just pesticides, but, but other inputs, especially like fertilizers where perhaps something looks good in the greenhouse or in a growth chamber uh, but it doesn't translate to the field. And that's kind of what we saw with mustard seed meal. There was actually some, some demonstrable uh, pre-emerge herbicide activity from mustard seed meal in a growth chamber uh, and in Petri dishes. But to use that effective amount on a larger scale, like in your yard or your garden, it's just completely, you know, in a, it's, not, it's not viable. Uh, you'd have to haul in a whole semi truck load for your your yard to make it work, and so. Uh, did you try uh, this with Did you try this with broadleaf weeds? Because in the northeast, we use corn gluten meal to suppress plantain. Uh, no, this what you're looking at here. This was all annual grass weeds, not broadleaf weeds. And so, broadleaf weeds, I, I don't know. I don't know with uh, corn gluten meal. Uh, we don't have any data. Um, in the mustard seed meal stuff, that's what we were looking at was specifically Palmer amaranth. Um, but we got, we got good activity in a small scale where you could put a lot of material in a small area like a Petri dish, but uh, it didn't really translate well, uh, you know, on a, an acre type basis, right? It just, it just wasn't viable. And it maybe it just works for plantain and we have a lot of plantain in the Northeast. <laughs> it could be, yeah, it could be. I have no idea. I have no idea when we take it to uh, Texas on one specific species. You, you never know. Uh, on the things we've tested, uh, corn gluten meal didn't show much promise. But again, that's just on the things that we've tested, right? So when it comes to pesticides, anything that's uh, classified as a pesticide in the U.S. comes with a label. Um, some of the products we use in the row crop world, it, that label is like a book that's glued to the side of the container. Uh, some of the homeowner type products, you go to Lowe's or Home Depot, pull those off the shelf, they might have two pages or five pages. Um, doesn't mean it's any less important. That piece of paper on the side of the, the container is the law, okay? 
there's a lot of work and, and millions of dollars that goes into developing those, those labels and all the language in them. Uh, so you've got to read those things before you use any pesticide. Uh, and in my world, that's primarily herbicides. Um, you don't want something like this to happen, right? I, I, don't, I don't know the story behind this. I stole this off of Twitter or something like that. But I'd have to imagine that the person that did that, if they had read the label and comprehended everything in it, they would not have done what they did there, right? Maybe they thought they were spraying a, a broadleaf weed herbicide and they actually had Roundup in the tank. Or maybe they were spraying something that would have been safe on the lawn, but they didn't calibrate the sprayer, they didn't know the dose, whatever. Um, these are the kinds of problems you don't want to see. Uh, I've, I've seen some almost as bad situations in neighbors' lawns uh, over the years, and it, it's kind of funny, but it's also sad because that tells you that person was not reading the instructions, which are the law around the use of that pesticide. So one of the first things you need to look at on a pesticide label uh, are what's in it, okay? You, you've got the trade name. Uh, we mentioned pen, Pendulum earlier. It's a turf herbicide primarily. Okay, that's, that's the brand name. Um, Roundup would be a brand name. We, we all know Roundup. It's been around for a while. But the more important thing is what's actually beneath that. Typically, that's going to be right there on the first page of the, the label. Uh, you're going to see the common name. And you're going to see a really long chemical name for the active ingredient followed by that common name, which is kind of the shorthand version of it. So Roundup, most of the time, a Roundup product contains glyphosate. Uh, in the case of Pendulum, that contains pendimethalin. The, the Roundup world has gotten really confusing because that company, I believe it's Scott's, uh, licensed the, the Roundup name. And they have started basically selling Roundup branded products that contain other things than glyphosate. And so a lot of times, you know, I'd go to the, the store and just grab Roundup off the shelf thinking I'm you know, I know what's in that because all Roundup is glyphosate. Well, that's not true anymore. So it becomes really important to read the active ingredient and find out what's in it. Because that thing on the shelf that says Roundup might have something completely different in it. And that's going to change the way you use that herbicide. So here's the pendulum label. Under active ingredient, you can see the common name, pendimethalin, followed by the IUPAC chemical name, which is uh, not important for most of us, uh, just basically gives you a way to uh, determine the structure of that molecule back and forth from the name to the structure and so on. And then also uh, you can see the percentage of active ingredient. A lot of folks will go off of that when comparing products. Um, that's actually not the, the way to go about it. Most of these herbicides are, are you know, liquid formulation. But you, if you want to do an apples to apples comparison, you need to look down beneath uh, that section where it shows the percentage of active, active ingredient and look for pounds per gallon of active ingredient. That's more useful. So in this case, Pendulum 3.3 contains 3.3 pounds of pendimethalin per gallon. Uh, with herbicides that are formulated as salts, um, uh, and amines, things like that, it's really important uh, especially with glyphosate products, you need to look at the pounds per gallon, not necessarily the percentage of active ingredient. Next thing you need to look at are the signal words. On that front page of the label, that gives you some uh, idea of just how, uh, how careful you need to be with this stuff. Okay, if it just says caution, that's slightly toxic orally, dermally, or through inhalation, slight eye or skin irritation. Uh, you step up to warning. Now we're looking at moderate toxicity, danger. That's a sign to really pump the brakes and make sure you're reading that label, following all of the PPE requirements. It can cause severe eye damage or skin irritation. And then if you see danger and poison in a skull and crossbones, and we have very few products anymore that do that. I can think of one right now uh, in the herbicide world. Uh, those are highly toxic by any route into the body. Uh, most of the things we use in turf um, uh, and even the ornamental world are going to be in that caution warning area. Uh, some of the 2,4-D products will have um, warning on them because they, they can damage your eyes if they splash into your eyes. Also, 
uh, precautionary statements are in that label, human and animal hazards, environmental hazards, um, first aid, statement of practical treatment, things you need to know if an accident happens. Um, also, you'll see re-entry intervals. So if I spray my yard with product X, how long before I can let my daughters out there to play uh, without having protective equipment on? Um, most products are gonna be four, 12, 24 hours, uh, but occasionally you'll get into one that's uh, maybe a period of days after you spray. I can't think of any homeowner type products that would do that, but you need to read the label and find that out. Uh, so if I spray my yard, the label says I need to wait 24 hours before I turn my kids loose. That's really important to know. Then we need to understand uh, selectivity, uh, especially in the turf world, because we have a lot of selective herbicides in that arena. So a selective herbicide is a herbicide that is only going to be effective against certain types of plants. And so in our turf grass settings, we use a lot of herbicides that are broadleaf killers because a broadleaf and a grass are very different physiologically. There's a lot of differences there that you can exploit with a herbicide. And we have a lot of products that can do that. They're very deadly against a broadleaf plant. They're very safe on grasses. And we have herbicides that do the opposite of that, that just kill grasses, but are very safe on broadleaf plants. And we'll talk about the graminicides um, here in a little while. And then you have non-selective herbicides that really don't care what kind of plant they kill. They're gonna have some activity on just about anything. Glyphosate would be a good example of that. Glyphosate is mostly non-selective. So if you spray grass, broadleaf weeds, um, sometimes sedges as well, it'll control most of those plants. If it's green, it's probably gonna have some activity on them. So we might spray a selective herbicide in our yard to kill broadleaf weeds, or we might spray a selective herbicide in our garden to kill grasses, but we're not gonna spray Roundup in either of those scenarios over the top, right? Because we'll kill everything. We don't want that. And then uh, translocation or movement of herbicides becomes important. Uh, we have some products that are just contact herbicides. So if you uh, look up the vinegar, homebrew type things that you can make uh, on your own, those would be a contact herbicide. They don't move within the plant. They're not systemic. So when you spray them on a weed, it kills the tissue that the spray lands on. Okay, that's okay if you're just killing annual weeds or you're trying to control annual weeds. But if we're trying to control a perennial, we want something that's going to move in the plant because we need to kill the root system as well. Um, Roundup or glyphosate, that would be a systemic herbicide. A lot of the broadleaf type herbicides we use in, in turf grass, those are systemic as well. So they actually get into the plant and they move within the vascular tissue of the plant. A systemic herbicide is going to take longer to work usually than a contact herbicide. So if I spray the, the, the vinegar homebrew on a weed, it's, it's gonna start looking pretty sick very quickly. It's basically burning, oxidizing tissue. Uh, a systemic herbicide like glyphosate or Roundup, uh, that's gonna take a week, 10 days, sometimes two weeks because we're waiting for that herbicide to get moved to the zones of the plant where it does its job. And in the case of Roundup, it's inhibiting some enzymes that starve the plant. So this is what your contact herbicides look like. This is uh, Paraquat. Um, we're really not gonna use this in, in any setting in a, in a homeowner situation or a garden situation, but sometimes we use them in, in row crops. But Paraquat's a, a contact herbicide. So a vinegar solution would do the same thing at a high enough rate. Where you see that dead tissue on that soybean plant, that's where the spray landed. That plant will not die. That's as bad as it's gonna look because there's a lot of green tissue that's still just fine. It's gonna grow out of it okay. Um, if we got enough spray on that plant, we could kill it uh, as long as it's just an annual. But if it's something more tough than that, if it's a perennial or if it's a big annual that has a lot of leaf, a lot of foliage, that's when we start to need a systemic herbicide, something that moves within the vascular tissue of the plant, um, either through the phloem or the xylem. Um, phloem mobile materials, which would be glyphosate, that's gonna move down to the root system primarily, uh, moves with the flow of energy from the, the leaf down to the root. Uh, xylem mobile herbicides like atrazine move the opposite direction. They move in the 
the tissue that transports water from the root up to the new growth. So atrazine is typically only going to go outward and upward in the plant, whereas your glyphosate is going to move downward down to the root system. Another really important thing to know about herbicides is that some of them are very persistent in the soil and that might be a good thing or a bad thing depending on what you're doing and if you're aware of that property. When we use herbicides for pre-emerge weed control, we want one that's persistent in the soil. That means it re remains active in the soil for an extended period of time. We want something that's gonna stay in our garden, okay, and prevent seeds from germinating, prevent them from emerging for say three or four weeks. That's a good pre-emerge herbicide if it does that. Some herbicides, um, very, very low persistence. So glyphosate would be a good example. It gets bound up very quickly. It basically doesn't have any soil activity. Uh, a lot of our post-emerge herbicides are that way. Um, and that's okay. As long as we know that, we know that it's not going to give us any pre-emerge activity. The, the real nightmare scenario here is when somebody uses a herbicide that they didn't know had persistent effects. Uh, we use some herbicides in uh, hay fields and pastures that are extremely persistent and it doesn't cause us any problem if I'm a pasture um, operator and I'm raising beef cattle. But if I was to take some of that cut forage and put it in my garden, I could ruin a tomato garden for two years with some of those herbicides because they're very persistent. So you've got to know what you're applying, you've got to know what you're using. Um, if we want a pre-emerge, persistence is a good thing, but we need to know about it. You need to be aware. And sometimes we have conditions that extend the, the persistence of a, of a residual herbicide. Now we're lucky in South Texas that we have relatively warm and wet winters. Um, that's a good thing. The warmer it is, the more moisture we have, the quicker herbicides break down. And so, you know, we get into far west Texas where I'm from, we have herbicides out there that'll persist for two years Whereas in this environment, they won't persist more than about six months because of our environment. We're relying on microbes to break these, these herbicides down in most cases. And so if it's warm and wet, they're very active and they do their job. So cool temperatures can be a problem. Uh, an unusually cold winter can contribute to issues with herbicide carryover the next spring. Um, very heavy soil texture can also sometimes play a role because it binds up the herbicide, keeps it from being broken down. Um, but usually that means it's not, not really available to roots taking it up either. Um, very dry conditions, like I said, limited rainfall or irrigation. And then of course, high use rates. So even with a herbicide that's not all that persistent, if I put a whole lot of it out there because I don't know the, the, the proper rate or I didn't calibrate my sprayer, it could be very persistent just because of the, the amount I put out there. It's going to take a long time for it to break down. So our spray equipment, a lot of times is, is looking something like this, right? We're, we're not using great big boom type sprayers, uh, a lot of pump up sprayers, backpack sprayers. Uh, we can put out some granulated herbicides, weed and feed type products, uh, you know, with the hand crank rig. Those all work really well. If you're going to get a pump up sprayer, the only thing I can recommend is, is get a good one. Um, on the backpack sprayer side of things, we've had really good luck with solo sprayers. Um, kind of buy once and cry once. I've had a lot of cheap ones that just don't last very long. Um, solos are more expensive, but, but they hold up. They have good pumps. They have good materials in the seals, so they tend to, to last a while. Um, when you're using a, a pump up or any kind of liquid application you know, material, whether it's a handheld pump up or a tractor or, or lawnmower mounted sprayer, you need to make sure you're cleaning it out on a regular basis, especially over the winter, because some of these herbicides can be kind of rough on the rubber and, and the metal in there. The more you clean them out, the longer they'll last. With liquid application equipment, we have to calibrate, especially if you're applying on a broadcast basis. So we're applying something to our whole lawn um, you know, per thousand square foot basis, or maybe even a per acre basis, we need to know what the output of that sprayer is so that we can mix up the appropriate amount in the tank. Uh, this is a, an old, old photo of a golf course in College Station that 
basically what, what happened here is, is the employee went out there with an improperly calibrated sprayer. Uh, it was putting out way more volume than he thought. Uh, and he mixed up a, a little too hot of a load and he sprayed a product that would have been safe on that grass, uh, but ultimately burned it really, really bad. Uh, the dose definitely makes the poison with all things, but especially herbicides. So if we apply too little, the weeds won't be affected too much, and we're going to have undesirable consequences in the form of crop injury. So you got to know how that sprayer is calibrated so you can mix it up properly. Uh, that depends on a lot of things. The pressure of the sprayer, uh, how fast you walk or drive, uh, the amount of the herbicide in the tank. Um, I'm not going to spend time going through the whole process, but I, I have a couple of guides. If you go to my website, um, which is that bit link, bit.ly slash STX crops, uh, you can go to the weeds and herbicides section and there's a couple of guides there for calibrating sprayers. The uh, second one, pressurized sprayer calibration is really more geared towards those of us, uh, like in my yard where I use a little pump up sprayer and I actually spray the whole yard with that equipment. That's not the best way to get an accurate dose, but there is, there is a method where you can get your calibration fairly close, even with that small equipment, uh, with just a little bit of simple math. So those two guides, I think they're PDFs on the website. Uh, you can download those and print them out and go through it. Okay, different types, different classes of herbicides. We got pre-emergence herbicides. We, we've kind of touched on this already. But those are products that control weeds before they emerge. They don't prevent uh, germination of weed seed. They, they merely prevent those plants from emerging, just like the name suggests. And so a lot of times uh, we, we either inhibit root or shoot formation with our pre-emerge herbicides. So when that weed starts to germinate, it takes in water from the soil around it. Uh, and if we have a pre-emerge herbicide in that soil zone, it's going to take in the herbicide at that same time. And by preventing, you know, either the root or the shoot from forming, we're never going to see that plant survive and, and actually uh, emerge from the soil. But all of our pre-emerges require some type of incorporation or activation. And that's the really important thing to remember uh, because we, we spray a pre-emerge on the soil, uh, but our weed seed that we're actually after is not on the soil surface where that herbicide just landed. It's actually down in the soil. A lot of our weeds that we go after uh, on a regular basis, they're in that top inch, half inch of the soil. They're not very deep. That's where most of them are coming from though. So we spray our herbicide, our pre-emerge on the soil surface. If it just sits there, it will not kill those weed seed just below it in the soil. Uh, we need something to move the herbicide into the soil. So we can do that mechanically. Sometimes we can, we can spray a herbicide and then till up a garden and incorporate the herbicide into the soil, uh, or we can use water. Uh, a lot of times we just water them in or we wait on a rainfall to wash the herbicide slightly into the soil so that it's there when those weed seed try to germinate. Uh, if you're looking at a pre-emerge, you need to read that label though to find out the right way to incorporate or activate it. Do I need to till it in? Do I need to turn on the sprinkler? If so, uh, how much water do I need to activate it? Those are important things to note. Uh, if we spray a pre-emerge and we don't activate it, it won't work. The weeds will come on right through that layer on the soil surface and they won't be uh, injured at all. And the reason we use pre-emerges so much, especially in turf grass is because we're, we're dealing with, we're dealing with desirable vegetation that's already established. So our turf, has already got a, a mature root system on it. So we can use a pre-emerge in that setting very, very safely. Because even though those, those materials might inhibit um, root growth slightly, we're only moving them into the very, very shallow zone of the soil. Whereas the, the established stuff, the established turf, it has root systems that extend way below that, that zone of, of treated soil with a pre-emerge. So they're not gonna be hurt to any significant extent by a pre-emerge. Same thing would be true in a, in a vegetable garden, uh, even in ornamentals. If we're using transplants to establish, we can use a lot of pre-emerge herbicides very safely, uh, especially things like treflan or, or pendimethalin, because we are putting something into that treated soil that already has a big extended root system on it. So we dig out a little spot, we put a transplant in, uh, that 
that large root system is not going to be hurt by that small zone of treated soil at the top. Post-emerge herbicides would be what most of us think of when we think herbicides, right? Like a, a Roundup type application. I, I have weeds growing, um, you know, on my sidewalk. I spray them, they die. I sprayed them after they were already up. A um, few key points there would be we don't want to spray weeds during um, uh, really stressful conditions. Okay, weeds that are stressed typically are more difficult to control. In almost every situation, the healthier plants are growing, the more easily we can kill them with a herbicide. Uh, we also have fewer crop injury uh, issues when we grow, when we spray under, you know, less extreme conditions. Also, uh, as we're transitioning from cool season uh, grasses in our yard to, to warm season, which it's not as big of a deal this far south, but uh, you don't have to go very far north along the coast to see this. In that transition period in the spring, that's really not a good time to spray a yard. Um, we're dealing with vegetation that's a little tender. It's just trying to come back uh, first thing in the spring. You want to give those plants some time to kind of establish and, and get off to some good growth before we put a herbicide out there. So again, healthy weeds are easier to kill. We also don't see as many crop injury issues um, when things are growing very well. Uh, if you're putting a post-emerge herbicide out, typically there's a rain fast interval uh, on the label. It'll tell you if you sprayed right now uh, and that material set out there for at least X number of hours, it's rain fast, meaning it's in the plant and it's gonna work. Now, if I sprayed Roundup, right now and it rained 15 minutes from now, um, that's gonna be a problem. That's too short of an interval. It's actually gonna wash the herbicide off before it gets into the plant. Uh, so we try to stay off, it, stay off of it with, with our watering for at least uh, a few hours, uh, but check the label. Some products are really quick in how they act. Some might need six hours, eight hours, uh, 12 hours, what have you. Also mowing can, can kind of throw a wrench into things. If we spray the weeds right now and then we come back tomorrow and mow them down, we might have just removed a lot of that herbicide in that cut material. And so we try not to mow very close to our herbicide application either before or after. Uh, we want to give herbicides some time to work to try to stay off of them for a day or two uh, after you spray or before you spray. For really tough perennials, and, and I'll give you some examples here in a little bit, um, sometimes we have to spray more than once. Uh, make sure you read the label and make sure that's allowed, but a lot of products would give you the ability to spray a certain number of times per season. Um, and so if we use a herbicide and it, it dings up that really tough weed in the yard, but it doesn't kill it, well, let's spray it again and, and see if we can catch it on the second shot. Some of our really tough broadleaf herbicides, perennial broadleaf uh, weeds, they might grow through one application of a broadleaf killer in the yard, but two or three is gonna kill them over the course of a, a season. Uh, also remember, you might need to add a surfactant or some other type of adjuvant to your product. Um, a lot of the things you buy off the shelf at say Home Depot or Lowe's will come prepackaged with a surfactant, but that's not always the case, especially in the case of the really concentrated type products. Uh, a lot of times those uh, are just strictly herbicide in the container. So you need to add something to it to make it work properly. Uh, because a lot of times when we're spraying a post-emerge herbicide, we're spraying a really waxy leaf surface. Okay, if you spray a water solution on a waxy surface, it's going to beat up. It's not going to have very good coverage of that leaf. And we want good coverage so we can get the herbicide into the plant. Um, so a surfactant is basically a, a soapy material most of the time, and it helps kind of soften that cuticular wax on the leaf. It also helps spread out the, the droplets on the leaf surface so we get more herbicide into the plant um, and we get a better result. But read the label. A lot of the products you see out there will already have a surfactant, uh, but make sure you, you, you know if you need to add it uh, before you use them. So I want to kind of step out of that topic to touch on something that I think a lot of folks have questions about right now because in, in, a, in a lot of arenas, especially homeowner use and, and gardens and lawns and what have you, a lot of us use glyphosate or Roundup, or what we used to know as Roundup uh, products. 
uh, one of the most widely used herbicides in the world, especially here in the U.S. We still use a lot of, of glyphosate in row crops as well. Uh, but the last couple of years, there's been a lot of questions about glyphosate and its safety. And I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I, I do want to I do want to touch on it because I'm sure some of y'all have these questions. Um, glyphosate has been around for quite a while now, um, commercialized in the 80s. Um, in the row crop world, we've been using uh, transgenic technologies to allow us to spray glyphosate since uh, the early 2000s. Um, really effective, non-selective herbicide. Um, it, it's it's attractive for a number of reasons. Number one, it's so widely used, it's really cheap. Okay, so it's very economical, it's very effective. Also, it has very little soil activity, uh, almost none. And so we don't have to worry about it around established uh, plants, like you were to spray underneath a tree or a shrub that you like. As long as you don't get the spray on that plant, it's very safe because we don't typically see any appreciable soil uptake or root uptake. Um, so we use a lot of glyphosate. The way that it works, is by inhibiting an enzyme uh, called the enol perubal shikimate 3 phosphate synthase enzyme. Just shorten that to EPSPS. Um, that enzyme is in a pathway that leads to the production of three amino acids, tryptophan, tyrosine, and phenylalanine. That enzyme is only found in plants, um, in, in some autotrophic bacteria. And so glyphosate inhibits that enzyme which if you stop that pathway at that point, you stop the production of those three amino acids. And that plant eventually will no longer be able to make uh, certain proteins that it needs to, to have to survive because it doesn't have those, those amino acids. So you're basically starving the plant to death kind of in a slow manner with glyphosate. The, the issues around glyphosate or, or what's been showing up in the, the news the last few years kind of really kicked off in 2015. This agency called the IARC, or International Agency for Research on Cancer, <coughs> excuse me, classified I tried glyphosate. I to listen to the administrative as, board meeting, but it's on um, that Microsoft team. And I, you're talking. They're probably hearing you. Yeah, I, we can hear you. I'm sorry. It's all right. <laughs> um, anyways, the IARC in 2015, they, they put glyphosate into this category called group 2A, um, which they basically explained that means probably causes cancer. And that, that got a lot of folks very uh, concerned, and it, and it should. Um, if you look at their classification system, um, there, there's, some, there's some important things to note. Okay, in group 2A with glyphosate, they, they also have things like uh, very hot beverages, red meat, uh, burning wood in a fireplace. These are the things they, they put into that probably causes cancer category. Okay, and there is some science behind some of those things to, to maybe put them into those, those groups. Uh, the important thing to remember is that the IR doesn't look at risk. They only assess potential carcinogenicity. Uh, they don't think about actual human exposure and they don't conduct risk assessments, which is really important when you get into pesticide safety. Um, and so we can move that a little further along here and look at um, what risk really is, and that's toxicity by exposure, okay? IARC is only looking at possible toxicity. They're not looking at exposure and, you know, of a product that's properly used when people use the right PPE, or personal protective equipment and follow the label guidelines, you're not gonna have very much exposure, uh, almost minimal. Okay, so something that's very toxic, but you have almost no exposure, doesn't pose much of a risk. Whereas something that's very low toxicity that you have a lot of exposure to could be very high risk. So water would be a good example. Very low toxicity, but with enough water, you know, you can't have some problems. Uh, so, IARC doesn't think in those terms, um, and I think that's important for folks to know when they try to wrap their head around why they put glyphosate into that category that they did. Uh, that kind of led to a snowball effect. Uh, a couple years later, California put glyphosate into their uh, list of things known to the state of California to cause cancer, that Proposition 65 sticker that you see on a lot of products. 
Okay, glyphosate is now on that list. Um, and I'll give you uh, some additional info here in a second. That's becoming a little complicated, but they put it on their list. And then um, beginning late 2018, I believe, uh, we saw this court case where um, a gentleman who worked for a school district that, that had used Roundup in, in his daily job uh, developed non-Hodgkin lymphoma and uh, went to court saying that, that glyphosate caused that. And uh, that's kind of where things uh, reached a kind of a critical point. And you've probably seen some of the, the commercials on the TV, class action type lawsuit stuff around glyphosate. So I, I, think it's, I think it's good to pump the brakes a little bit and actually look at the science behind it. Uh, because I use glyphosate around my house um, on as limited a basis as I can, but I do use it. And I do have a couple of little girls running around the house. And, and you want to understand this stuff before you start buying everything that you see on the TV or on, on Facebook. And so one of the best ways to look at this is actually uh, from uh, the website I have shown here, Plan Out a Place. It's, it's one of my counterparts in Wyoming, Andrew Kniece. Uh, Dr. Kniece put this together, gosh, two, three years ago now. Um, and it's one of the best condensed ways to look at glyphosate and the, the potential links to cancer. And so if you look at all of the studies that were done to that point, um, and he did this, yeah, I see in 2018. And you look at whether or not glyphosate exposure resulted in increased or decreased risks of cancer of all these different cancer types. You can see points to the left of the line indicate a decreased risk of cancer, that type of cancer with glyphosate exposure. Those on the right-hand side indicate an increased risk of cancer. The one that stands out here is that non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. You see... Uh, a number of points on the right-hand side. So that tells us in those studies, they're finding an increased risk of cancer linked to glyphosate use. And I think this is probably what uh, IARC was looking at when they put glyphosate in the category that they did. Um, all the other cancers on this list that have been studied, you know, basically center on the line or actually to the left of the line, which would be very little concern. Uh, the, the problem with those non-Hodgkin lymphoma studies um, that are in that chart, those points on the line, or the point, points on the chart, is those are all case control studies. And so with a case control study, you're looking at a group of people who, in this case, use glyphosate versus a group of people who do not. And you look at uh, the incidence of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. The problem with that, with herbicide use, especially with glyphosate use, is that you tend to end up with a group of agricultural workers in one hand and a group of non-ag workers on the other hand, because the people that tend to have the most glyphosate exposure are those in the ag field. We use so much of it in soybeans and corn and, and cotton and even in non-traded crops. Um, and that's, that's where it gets a little muddy because there's a lot of other differences between ag workers and non-ag workers than just glyphosate. Uh, we're exposed to diesel exhaust fumes every day right? That probably isn't good for us either. We're exposed to hydraulic fluid. We're exposed to other pesticides. So there's, there's a little more going on there than you can tease out with case control studies. So the best way to look at this that, that I can think of is actually shown on the lower right-hand side. This is a study that's been going on for um, actually 28 or 29 years now. I haven't updated this slide, but it's called the Agricultural Health Study, where it's just a group of ag workers uh, specifically pesticide applicators that have been followed for that period of time. There's 54,000 uh, participants in that group. And um, every year they fill out a survey of, you know, things about their health, uh, things that have developed, what have you, over the course of their life. And it makes this really good group of people to study uh, within the group of being an ag worker. Okay, so we can really drill down on glyphosate exposure with that AHS study. And so when you separate the AHS people out into quartiles from Q1, which is those that have very little, if any, exposure to glyphosate to Q4, which are those that are using it almost daily, um, which is what you're looking at in that chart, and you look at non-Hodgkin's lymphoma uh, incidence, we actually don't see any differences between those groups. And so while there are case control studies that might point us towards there being more of a risk, 
the AHS is telling us that it's not glyphosate, that it's probably something else within the, the group of, of ag workers. So uh, I could spend another hour talking about this because there's been a lot of questions the last couple of years, but that's where I want to kind of leave it. Um, you know, the, the science right now is not convincing me um, of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma being an issue. If there is a problem, I want to know about it as well. Uh, but I haven't seen anything solid that would lead me to think that glyphosate is really a, a problem when it comes to the, that type of cancer. Um, our EPA, uh, Health Canada, uh, WHO, there's a bunch of different organizations there. Those that do risk assessments uh, have not made that linkage. They have not said that glyphosate uh, poses any carcinogenic risk to humans. Uh, additionally, in the U.S., there's a big safety margin built into what EPA allows. And so our da daily exposure limits for glyphosate are uh, basically 100x lower than the lowest dose at which we see uh, no adverse uh, uh, effects seen to the, the sample group. So there's a big safety margin built into what we do in this country. Uh, also, EPA uh, got after California a bit uh, last fall and basically said that, you know, this, this Proposition 65 thing doesn't really hold water uh, and that labels claiming glyphosate is known to cause cancer are false and Prop 65 labeling uh, misinforms the public and they will no longer approve product labels uh, that claim glyphosate causes cancer because there's just not any, any hard data behind that. And so they're hashing that problem out right now. I'm not sure how California is going to handle that, but they'll have to figure that out. There's also been some mess in the news uh, a couple of years ago about glyphosate and, and beer and Cheerios and a bunch of other products. Uh, we don't have necessarily all the time to go through all of these, but just know those were very, very small amounts. Um, uh, one of the ones I like in the, in the wine example, to get to the, um, the, the dose that you would actually see a problem with glyphosate consumption, you'd have to drink 308 gallons of wine every, um, uh, sorry, you'd have to drink 308 gallons. That would be a bottle of wine every minute for life without sleeping to reach that critical level of glyphosate uh, intake. And that was at the highest level detected in wine. So again, I'm not so concerned about that. Yes, we can detect glyphosate at part per billion levels, but ultimately that doesn't really mean anything that's such a tiny, tiny fraction. So I hope that answered more questions than it brings up on the glyphosate issue, but there's definitely been an increased number of phone calls the last couple of years to me and to others at this office asking about it, and rightly so. And so if you have questions on that or other uh, pesticide safety issues, feel free to call me, email me. I'd be happy to visit with you. So moving on to some specific examples, I think we've got about 30, 40 minutes left here. Um, I wanna start with managing weeds and ornamentals. And I can make this real simple and just say we, we hand pull because there's not a lot of chemical tools that we can use in that setting. There are a few and we'll talk about them, but really for me in an ornamental setting, uh, I'm hand chopping, I'm hand pulling, things like that. We can use um, cultural methods, things like mulches, fabrics that shade out uh, bare soil, that works fine. Uh, and we do have a few herbicides that we can use in, in certain settings. But mulch is, you know, pretty simple. Anything that covers that soil uh, is going to suppress weed growth. And if it's thick enough and durable enough, it's going to keep weeds from coming up for a long time. Uh, with the added benefit of having kind of a breathable uh, layer on the soil surface that helps conserve soil moisture, keep the soil surface cooler, um, save a little water where we can. Landscape fabric would be in that same boat, okay? Uh, anything that shades out the soil is gonna, gonna work pretty well at suppressing weed growth. Uh, but from what I understand, what I can gather, on a large scale, those landscape fabrics get very expensive very quickly. Uh, but in a smaller setting, they can work very well. You wanna cover them up with mulch. They're not permanent, uh, depending on uh, the grade of material you use, they can last a number of seasons, but they are not, uh, they're not a lifetime investment. And also occasionally you'll deal with things like sedges 
um, that have that really rigid kind of pointy ceiling to them that they can actually come up through some of these landscape fabrics. Um, but very effective for what they are. And then of course, hand pulling, hand hoeing. Again, understand what you have. Is it annual? Is it perennial? If I pull this weed up, is it going to come back from the root? Uh, if so, I'm going to get the shovel out and I'm going to dig up that root system. Um, so very effective in a small scale, larger scale. You can use broadcast tillage, of course, but like I said earlier, that's going to stimulate additional flushes of weeds, especially the next time you get a rain or you turn on the water. Uh, you brought more weed seed up when you do that tillage operation. So be aware of that. Be ready to do it again if you start going down that route. Um, as far as herbicides, there's a few situations where we can use um, chemical means. For annual grasses, we have pre and post emerge um, uh, tools in our toolbox. Uh, we can keep them from coming up with things like uh, pendimethalin or treflan. And then we have graminicides that can control them post emerge. Perennial grasses, we can use post emerge herbicides as well. Uh, sedges, primarily, we, we rely on post-emerge. It's really hard to control sedges before they come up. And then broadleaf weeds in an ornamental setting, are that's kind of a difficult target to hit because typically we're talking about ornamentals that are also broadleaves. And so if you want to kill a broadleaf weed in a broadleaf crop, uh, there's not too many tools that you can use in the chemical world to do that. So the main thing we use in the ornamental world would be the dinitro anilins. And I mentioned several of these already, treflan, surflan, pendulum, which is pendimethalin. Um, those are dinitro anilins. We, we call them yellow herbicides in the crop world uh, because they're yellow, okay? They're bright yellow. If you get them on your clothes, you're gonna have yellow stains um, for the life of that piece of clothing. And so uh, very effective though, they're, they're mostly um, grass killing herbicides. So they control annual grasses. We also control some, some broadleaf species that have very small seeds. Um, a big seedling or a big seed is gonna have enough energy that it can grow through a, a yellow herbicide. But these can be used um, very effectively. Just remember to irrigate, uh, do something to activate or incorporate that herbicide. Uh, we don't wanna spray them on wet foliage. So if your desirable plants have just been watered or there's still a dew out, we don't wanna spray uh, something like treflan over the top. It's not going to kill them, but it can damage the foliage of the plant. Uh, it's going to get into that uh, little bit of dew down at the bases of the leaves. It's going to sit there, perhaps burn the tissue a little bit. Um, you can use them in the fall or spring. When it comes to summer around here, typically we don't have a lot of weed uh, flushes to deal with right in the heat of summer, uh, but I like to use uh, the, the DNAs or the yellow herbicides in, in our house um, late January, early February, and then I might do it again in September, October, because we have another month, month and a half of good warm weather uh, before things go dormant there. I mentioned uh, selective post-emerge grass control. So we have graminicides. These are herbicides that are strictly active on grasses that we can use. So if you're dealing with a, an ornamental that's a broadleaf plant, we can use a graminicide to kill grasses around it and leave that broadleaf ornamental very safe. Uh, they're all post-emerge herbicides, uh, but you can see some of the trade names here, but main thing is look at the active ingredient, Sethoxidim and Fluazifop uh, are, are a couple of them. We call these the FOPs and the DIMs in the weed science world. Uh, there's a few other ingredients as well, but you'll see Sethoxidim and Fluazifop in a number of products. Uh, they're graminicides. They, kill grasses. So you can use them in any non-grass ornamental, whether it's woody plant, um, herbaceous plants. Uh, there's a lot of different uses here. As long as it's not a grass, uh, it's going to be very, very safe. You don't want to spray these on open blooms in general. That's just not a good idea. There's a lot of really sensitive structures in an open flower. Um, it's not going to kill the plant if you spray an open flower, but it is going to probably malform that flower. Um, and if you want that plant to actually make some seed, it, it can result in some sterile, uh, sterile flowers down the road. Um, I get this question a lot. Well, can I use a graminicide to kill nutgrass? 
No, the, the problem is that what most folks call nut grass is actually nut sedge. And we, we looked at purple nut sedge and yellow nut sedge a number of times through this. Uh, nut sedge is a sedge. It, it, it is a monocot like a grass, but it's not a grass. And graminicides are very specific in what they kill. So cethoxidem will not kill a sedge. It's, it's very, very safe on that species. Uh, just grasses have that sensitivity. All right, pre-emerge broadleaf control. Um, you know, there, there might be some additional options since, since I made this slide, but it, it's been a two or three years. And at that time, gallery was the main product out there. Um, active ingredient, isoxabin, uh, used mostly in woody ornamentals, uh, but controls a lot of annual broadleaf weeds. Uh, if you're gonna reseed that area, there's a two month reseeding restriction before you put in any annual, uh, or sorry, any broadleaf uh, plants from seed. Sedge herbicides are out there for sure. Uh, sedge problems can be a, a real headache, especially if you've got things like uh, plastic down or, or fabric down even. Uh, like I mentioned, those sedges have a really uncanny ability for penetrating that stuff and, and poking holes in it. Uh, so sedge herbicides are out there. Bazagran, uh, Bazagran TO, that's important. Plain Bazagran is not a sedge herbicide, but Bazagran, Turf and Ornamental, uh, Manage and Image are all very effective. Most of the nut sedge I see is, is typically yellow nut sedge, and any of those products will control an, uh, yellow nut sedge. Purple nut sedge, you'd have to use Manage or Image. And then the annual sedges, there's a variety of them we get. All three of these products work just fine. All right, vegetable gardens. Uh, we have even fewer chemical options in a vegetable garden. Uh, there's so few products um, that have that label uh, language on them that we can use that uh, basically you're looking at using uh, something non-selective before you ever plant the garden and that's just about the extent of it. Uh, so as you're preparing that bed for a vegetable garden, you could use uh, tillage to clean that area up, but going back to what I said earlier, if you till an area up, you're liable to find a bigger flush of weeds uh, after the next rain. And so we could use a non-selective herbicide like glyphosate. Uh, you could even use those vinegar solutions um, as long as you're just dealing with annual weeds to chemically control the vegetation, the weeds before you put in a vegetable garden uh, and then allow some time for you to kill those weeds, put some water on it or get a rain, let that area flush with weeds again and kill them again. And so if we do that, we, we're starting to exhaust the amount of weeds that are gonna come up in that, that field because we haven't disturbed the soil at all. We just let the weeds flush a couple of times and kill them. Then we put in a, a vegetable garden. Um, one of the only things we can do to chemically control weeds in season is to use uh, transplants. So if we're using transplants, then we can use something like trifluralin, uh, one of those yellow herbicides, as a pre-emerge. Because we're putting a transplant that has an established root system into the garden, we can put that into a treflan treated bed uh, with, with uh, quite a bit of safety. Okay, we're still gonna have the treflan there around that transplant to keep grasses and some broadleaf weeds from coming up, but it's gonna be very safe on that transplant. If you're using seeded uh, propagules, you're, you're not even going to think treflan. If you put treflan down, then you plant seed into it, you're going to have problems. So we want to keep transplants on one side of the garden, seeded crops on the other. And then from that point there on, really, we're, we're using a lot of, you know, hand weeding, uh, hoeing, chopping, what have you. Um, again, a very aggressive disturbance of the soil is going to probably stimulate more weed problems than you solve. So you want to be very um, uh, careful. If you're going to chop weeds, don't take a big chop out of the garden. Just chop the stem of that plant. Uh, we don't want to disturb the soil any more than we have to because we don't want to stimulate those additional flushes of weeds. Uh, if you've got a lot of space between plants, then you can use post-emerge herbicides in between plants, okay? Uh, glyphosate, uh, maybe glyphosate. I, I'm not sure how comfortable I'd be with that. If you're going to spray uh, underneath a shield like this, I'm okay using a glyphosate or Roundup product. 
I just, I, I really worry if we have any amount of spray drift that gets onto the plant that we like, glyphosate's systemic, okay, it's gonna get into that plant and it could wreak havoc for the next week or two. Um, so, you know, be very, very careful about spray drift. Get one of these if you can. Uh, I've even used Gatorade bottles, like the 32 ounce Gatorade bottles. Cut the bottom out of the bottle and duct tape that around your spray nozzle on your spray wand. Uh, put the neck of the bottle around the spray wand. Uh, use that as a shield. So as I'm going through the garden, I put that little bottle or the spray shield right on top of the weed I want to kill and I pull the trigger and I spray it. Uh, that's an okay way to use Roundup. If you don't have a shield, I'd be really nervous uh, with Roundup use. Uh, now a contact herbicide like one of those uh, vinegar solutions, that would be much safer because if you do get some spray drift on your desirable plants, it's probably not going to kill them unless you really get a lot of spray on them. It's just going to burn them, make them look ugly, but they'll grow out of it. Uh, but still not a bad idea to have a spray shield in your vegetable garden, regardless of what you're using. And then really important, never use a herbicide that's not labeled for use in a garden. Uh, I get these questions all the time and it's not just with gardens, but folks will say, okay, well, I have this, you know, product X that I found in my barn or in my garage. Uh, you know, it says it's labeled for such and such crop. Well, what I'm growing is kind of similar to that. Can I use it in my garden? No, if it's not specifically labeled for the use that you're intending it for, uh, we don't use it. And that's really important because some of the products that we use in, say, pastures, very safe in pastures, but if they got into a garden, you could ruin a bed for a year, two years, sometimes longer, because they're very persistent. Um, if, if, if the product is not labeled for what you're trying to do with it, there's likely a very good reason behind it, and usually it's crop safety. Okay, so uh, we don't have a lot of products available in vegetable gardens, unfortunately. So again, it's going to be more labor intensive, um, but we, we don't want to start stretching out there and using things that aren't illegal. Now, turf grass is a little different. There, there's a lot of products available for use in turf grass. Um, if you consider turf a crop, turf is actually one of the biggest, if not the biggest crops in the United States. Um, so there's a lot of acres of turf grass in our yards. So there's been a lot of investment, a lot of research over the years to find herbicides that, that we can use in those settings. So we've got a lot to work with there. Um, and I'm not a turf grass expert. So my understanding of turf herbicides is very simple. Uh, if you really want to get into the weeds on turf herbicides and what's out there and available and the newest, latest, greatest thing, we do have turf specialists in Texas that you can call, um, but I just want to hit kind of the high points. So if we're dealing with annual grass problems in our lawn, especially the summer uh, perennial lawns that we have in South Texas, that's not too difficult to control. Okay, we have annuals coming from a seed. Um, we, can, we can exploit that difference in those two species with a herbicide. We can use a pre-emerge herbicide to keep those annual grasses from coming up and they're gonna be very safe on our perennial established turf grass. So dinitroanilins, the yellow herbicides that we've already touched on, uh, Barricade, Pendulum, Surflan, Team Pro, XL, uh, these are all gonna be very effective on annual grasses. There's also some newer chemistries, uh, Dimension and Ronstar uh, that we can use as well. But again, very safe on your established turf. Anything that has a good solid root system under it uh, when you spray is gonna be very safe from these pre-emerges. The yellow herbicides in Dimension, they work by inhibiting root growth. And so if that little weed seedling is never, never able to produce uh, a really mature root system, it's not gonna survive, it's not gonna emerge from the soil. So you can see that root malformation on this weed seedling. Uh, Ronstar is a little different. It actually inhibits the shoot, but the end result is the same. It controls annuals before they emerge. Uh, for your summer annuals, things like crabgrass, uh, in this area it's a little difficult to nail that down because we don't have the same winter that they have in the rest of the country, but uh, the best timing I've been able to find is late January to mid-February, probably early February most years. If you'll go ahead and put out one of those pre-emerges, that's early enough to control those annual grasses. Uh, but every year is different. 
when those grasses get to the right soil temperature, if they've got some soil moisture, they're going to emerge. And that might be New Year's Day. Uh, two or three years ago, we, we had a winter like that where I had sand burr up uh, before New Year's Day. New sand burr came up uh, very, very early that year. So it depends on the year. Uh, but again, most years, if you spray in January, mid to late January, that's probably the right time. Perennial grass weeds are very difficult. In a perennial grass crop like turf grass, we don't have really uh, too many herbicides, if any. They're going to control the perennial grass. Uh, we used to. We used to have something called MSMA. Uh, very effective, very commonly used in Bermuda grass, uh, especially for crabgrass control, also uh, sandbird control. Uh, the trouble is MSMA is not legal to use anymore. Uh, it's actually an organic arsenical, so it's just what it sounds like. It's an arsenic derivative, and once you spray it, it never goes away. Um, so it didn't take too long for folks to realize that's a problem, and we don't want to accumulate arsenic in the soil. And so that's been off the market for a long time now. Uh, doesn't mean you can't find it in people's garages from time to time, but if you come across an MSMA product, an old product, you cannot use it anymore as of 2014. Uh, there was a little grace period there uh, for three years, but that's gone now. So if you have it, uh, let me know if you want to get rid of it. Uh, we can actually get that into a, a company that, that specializes in getting rid of these old pesticides and, and doing that the, the right way rather than, than pouring it out or, or spraying it. Um, for that same purpose though, we do have some products. You can use Vantage or Envoy in centipede grass to control uh, crabgrass and some other perennial grasses. Uh, and Zoysia, Claim Extra, and Fusillade, you know, can work, but none of these are as effective as MSMA was. And if you're in a Bermuda grass setting like I am or St. Augustine setting, you're, you're kind of out of luck. We, we really don't have any good options there. Uh, annual broadleaf weeds are a lot easier to control. Again, it's very different than the, the desirable vegetation. So we're trying to kill broadleaf plants in a grass crop. We can control those very easily with pre-emerge herbicides. Uh, we also have a lot of post-emerge options. Uh, perennial broadleaf weeds, kind of the same story. We have a lot of options out there. Uh, most of the time, these are going to contain growth regulators or sulfonylureas. Uh, in your St. Augustine, you're going to see a lot of products that contain atrazine, um, uh, pretty commonly used in that species. A lot of your broadleaf herbicides contain uh, basically these premixes. So the products that you, you tend to get off the shelf at, at you know, big box stores, they're going to have usually three to four different growth regulator herbicides like 2,4-D, uh, dicamba, MCPA, things like that, mixed in various concentrations uh, just as a general broadleaf killer. And most of those products work really, really well. Uh, just be careful because uh, any broadleaf weed in the area uh, or any broadleaf plant in the area, and that could be your garden or your neighbor's garden, uh, is going to be sensitive to those herbicides. And so we don't want to ding up our good plants. Um, you got to be careful with spray drift. Uh, you got to be careful with uh, spraying under really humid, hot conditions because sometimes the, the herbicide can actually turn into a vapor form and damage plants. Uh, those broadleaf herbicides don't care what broadleaf weed they kill. They're kind of indiscriminate. So you need to be, be wary of that. Um, I did mention really early on tonight Certain really tough broadleaf weeds, don't be afraid to spray them more than once. Um, Dayflower is a good example. Though actually, it kind of looks like a grass in that upper left photo, but that's a broadleaf weed. Very difficult to control. Um, that's going to take a, a couple of applications usually. You spray it once and it'll look very sick uh, maybe two weeks after you spray, and then you want to spray them again immediately. Don't let them regrow. Don't let them recover. Spray them again. Uh, to finish that job off. Uh, sedge control in a, in a turf setting is, is very easy. We've got a lot of options. Uh, sedge hammer is one of the best ones out there. Halosulfuron, you can use that in Bermuda, St. Augustine. Uh, it's halosulfuron. Um, for your perennial sedges, it's going to take a couple of applications. Um, Certainty is another product out there, Bermuda, St. Augustine. Um, 
It's going to control some other weeds outside of the sedge world, some broadleaf weeds as well. And then there's also monument for Bermuda grass and zoysia. Uh, it also controls perennial ryegrass. There's also some newer chemistries in the turf world. And it, I say newer, this slide was appropriate 10 years ago. They're really can't call them new anymore, but kind of different chemistry than what we tend to use with the 2,4-D and dicamba type weed killer. And these are sulfonyl ureas. Um, sedge hammer was one of those. You, you look at the active ingredient names and you notice they all look kind of similar. They end with U-R-O-N. So halosulfuron, metsulfuron, rimsulfuron. Uh, these are all part of the same class of chemistry. And basically, these are similar to glyphosate in a way. Uh, they in inhibit an enzyme in the plant that produces certain amino acids, but it's a different enzyme than what glyphosate inhibits, and it's different amino acids that they actually stop. But overall, they act the same way. They starve the plant over an extended period of time. Uh, you can see affected weeds in these photos. They, they basically just turn yellow. Uh, they're stunted over the course of a couple of weeks. And then two, three weeks down the road, they might actually die at that point. Uh, very slow acting in general. You can see uh, they, they actually uh, accumulate at the growing point. So you can see more injury right at the top of the plant where that herbicide is really uh, being moved to. Um, typically, though, the, the phone calls I get on sulfonyl ureas is that, hey, I sprayed it and my weeds aren't dying. Okay, and most of the time that's because they sprayed it last week or they sprayed it yesterday and they wanna see those weeds already showing some symptoms. You're not gonna see that with these sulfonyl ureas. Um, sometimes it's two weeks before you see any symptoms out there and uh, three to four, occasionally even longer than four weeks before the weeds actually die. And that's different than the growth regulating herbicides. The growth regulators, if you spray them today, um, you can come back an hour later and already see the weeds twisting and curling. So these are a little different. You just need to know that. Was Is there the glove of death application appropriate for these two then? I'm sorry, say that one more time. Is it is is it appropriate then to also use the glove of death m method of application with these like you would for glyphosate? Oh, glove of death. Is that wiping the herbicide onto the weed? Yeah, like you, you, you have a, a kitchen, a very thick kitchen glove that's like like an algae glove, and then you put a cotton glove on top of that, mm -hmm. and you have your prepared mixture, and you dip the cotton glove in the prepared mixture, and you only touch the plants you want to kill, and it'll take it down to the root and kill the that plant so you don't kill the other plants around it. We used to use this for poison ivy, but you can also use it for like uh, Brazilian pepper here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh with the sulfonyl ureas, I would not, uh, okay. because there, there, are, some of them you could, some of them you cannot. But it's hard to say that as a blanket statement, because some okay. of these sulfonyl ureas have a lot of soil activity, and if you were to glove of death a weed, you're probably going to get a fairly hot dose of that herbicide right there where you did that, and I'd be a little worried uh. about maybe root uptake into other plants in the area. Um, but that is a perfect use for glyphosate. I, I've not heard it called glove of death, so thank you for that. I'm gonna. It's an approved use. It's on the label. I'm gonna, well, I, I guess I ought to read the label, huh? <laughs> but yeah, sulfonyl ureas are, are really kind of wacky. Um, okay, high and high. Good herbicides, but they're every one of them is different. Some have a lot of soil activity. Some have none. Some will control grasses, some control broadleaves. Some control only certain grasses or certain broadleaves. So they're all different. It's hard to talk about them in broad terms. Um, the, the main thing that I worry about is the soil activity with some of them. Uh, Metsulfuron is one um, that I've run into some problems. Uh, actually got drug into legal issues with, with that herbicide over the years. So you got to be careful with them. On a high pH soil, they can be really, really persistent. Um, if it's one of those residual sulfonyl ureas, you can also see them moving in runoff water uh, after a heavy rainfall and causing issues that way. Um, but they're all different, okay? So again, going back to reading the label, uh, if you see one of those sulfonyl ureas, it's not a bad thing, um, but read the label because if there's a soil 
uh, activity aspect to that herbicide, it's going to warn you about that on the label. It's going to say, hey, don't spray this under your desirable trees or shrubs, or don't spray this up next to a stream. Uh, or if you spray this now, you have to wait so many months before you plant X, Y, or Z. Uh, again, read the label, just understand that some of those sulfonylureas can have those properties. Uh, this is some of that runoff water movement that I mentioned earlier. Um, they sprayed the, the SU up on that fringe area around that green, and then a heavy rain came um, within a week after they sprayed that and moved that herbicide. It's very water soluble, moved it into this rough area uh, and, and you can see that in the vegetation. So it's not a big problem in this setting, but if that was running off into your neighbor's yard or your neighbor's garden, that could be a real, real problem. Um, so good herbicides, just again, read the label and know what you need to watch out for. I think we're just about up against it on time. Um, I just wanna leave you with some links from uh, AgriLife uh, resources. Again, I'm, I am, not a turf grass expert or a horticultural expert. I'm just a, a general weeds guy and, and a row crop guy, but we do have people that specialize in those arenas. Okay, there's a whole horticulture department, agriculture, or sorry, aggiehorticulture.tamu.edu is their website. They do a lot of good work and they have a lot of good publications there. Um, publications.tamu.edu is actually part of my department, Soil and Crop Sciences. Uh, if you have just general questions about um, how herbicides do what they do, uh, weed identification, things like that, uh, we do have some guides on that website, and they're not oriented to just row crops. I mean, they have broader uh, applications. And then in the turf world, the, the best place to go is AggieTurf. So AggieTurf.tamu.edu, uh, that's one of our best websites. There's a lot of info there uh, once you start clicking through the screens, especially for weed ID and there's a big um, weed management, actually pest management guide there for turf grass. Uh, and then the last website there is mine again, bit.ly slash STX crops. You can get my contact info there. And um, also that sprayer calibration guide that I mentioned earlier, that's also on that website. So with that, uh, if we have questions, uh, or if we have time for questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, if you think of something later on down the road, feel free to reach out to me. If you go to that website at the bottom, you'll find all my contact info. There was a question submitted in chat that uh, we kind of grazed over. Um, it was, when using Remedy on Woody Bush, what kind of pump do you recommend since it requires a diesel mixture, uh, which, is which is hard on a typical sprayer? Yeah, yeah, those diesel carriers are, are pretty hard on the, the types of things you're gonna get at like Walmart or even tractor supply. You wanna look for a sprayer that has Viton seals. Um, that's a trade name of a type of seal, um, but those are very chemical resistant. So if you see um, a lot of the Solo products will have Viton seals, it'll say it on the box or on the container um, that you buy them in. Those are very good. They'll resist diesel. They'll resist a lot of the other things you might end up putting in that tank, but nothing's bulletproof. Um, like I said earlier, you, you got to clean them out, um, especially if you're putting diesel in the tank. Uh, as soon as you're done doing that, you need to wash it out really, really thoroughly because if that just sits in there, it's going to cause problems over time. Um, another issue I had years ago was we used to winterize our sprayers with diesel so they wouldn't freeze in the winter and uh, we had an issue where we were putting out some little fires around uh, brush fires that were starting to creep away from our house and somebody grabbed the sprayer that had diesel in it to put out a fire. And so that's uh, another one of those things. You got to clean them out. You don't want to have that kind of thing happen to you. Okay, well, thank you, Josh. <clears throat> Any other questions? Presentation. Any questions? Well, we got, I got a couple of announcements to make. Any questions? Okay, all right, uh, for announcements, I wanna remind you that next week, let me, uh, here it is so that you can see it. Hmm.
Uh, good luck pronouncing your last name. I have, uh, she's an agent in integrated pest management. Her first name is Kate. I, 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 I'm not touching that last name. <laughs> Kate Crumley. Thank you. <laughs> um, we'll be doing IPM and entomology. Uh, on Wednesday, we will have Grace Lopez from the Master Naturalist doing uh, a talk on the local weeds we have here. Um, so uh, we'll be ready for that. Is the schedule up where everybody can see? No, we just see a couple of your windows, including the picture roster. What well, it all looks so pretty. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, now you have the window. You need to maximize and, and select that window. All right. What I want to remind you is that next week, we do not meet on Monday and Wednesday. Oh. We meet on Tuesday and Thursday because Monday is a holiday. Oh. Okay? So if you look at your schedule, it's Tuesday and Thursday. It does right. say that on my schedule, but I did miss that detail. Thank you for smacking me upside the head. <laughs> uh, I, I've been working with... Uh, with Mary, she likes to go by Mary rather than by her Grace. She Since when? Okay, okay. I've been calling her Grace my for five years. Okay. So anyhow, I don't guess she's not the kind of person that's going to tell you that you need to call her by something else. Okay. But anyhow. I was okay. I was introduced to her. Never mind. Just right. let it go. Okay. Anyhow, she is. She's got a really good presentation, and she's got a bunch of clips uh, to show you for the lab where she went out and did some uh, field surveys of weeds. So I think you're going to really enjoy her presentation. All right. Uh, Please log on to VMS, the Volunteer Management System, and create your password so that you own your profile. Upload your information, make sure it's accurate, and keep up with it. Send me your selfie. If you don't want to upload it, I'll upload it for you. But I also need it so that we can put together the picture um, let me turn the video on. And if Dr. McGinty is still here, thank you so much. I was the most in-depth I've heard in a long time. And that's one of the things that has been missing from our education to get down the nitty gritty of what do I use? Thanks for inviting me. Okay. Josh, I sent you an email about getting your con full contact information so that you can put it in our database. You'll we'll see it in there. Do yes, I, I just I just hit send. You should be getting it any any minute now. Okay. Um, we're trying to create a uh, picture roster for this class, as well as for uh, we'll add it to the uh, once you become certified, we'll add it to the master gardener roster, uh, picture ID uh, roster. Please use, when you're sending email to uh, master gardener uh, officers, please use the official Gmail uh, and not their personal email. Okay, we have a, we have a policy of using our official Gmail for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is legal uh, reasons uh, because of freedom of information or legal uh, request. If you're using uh, your personal email, then all of your email is basically could be subpoenaed. 
So we send it to our official Gmail accounts. Mine's is one VP dot. Okay. So if you, we go by positional and we can establish a, uh, a Gmail account for you uh, for master gardeners so that your inbox doesn't get cluttered with um, master gardener email and your other email and it gets lost. And that's what happens when you send stuff to my personal email because I get about a hundred or so emails in my personal email every day. And sometimes I don't go through that. I only have time to go through my official email uh, inbox. And if it's not there, then I don't get to see it. And it may be two, three days later before I'm actually looking at my personal email, okay? Send me your contact information and a selfie so I can add you to our roster and I can make sure that uh, what we have uh, in VMS is accurate. I want to remind all the interns that your volunteer hours and CEUs are what are going to make you certified. Attending the class is only part of the process. Before you know it, we will be at 9 November, which is the last class, and we'll be done running classes. But you will still need your 50 hours of volunteer service and your six hours of CEUs. Now is the time to get it so that before the class is over, you are certified. We have many projects that you can work on. One of them that's in dire need of help right now because I call it the wolf closest to the sled. Okay, you shoot the wolf closest to the sled, the one that's gonna eat you. And that is the plant sale. Our plant sale is October 10th. We have numerous things that need to be done and we don't have enough people to do them. Many of them you can do from home, right at your own computer or with your cell phone. So if you'd like to get ours, this is a way to do it, okay? Do we have any questions? Okay, we will see you on Wednesday for Mary Lopez. I have a quick question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so those things you said that we can do from our computer for the plant sale, uh, how, do we, how do we find out what we can do? Email me and I will put you, tell me what, what's your general link, you know, are you the kind of person that likes to um, work from a list on a computer and make contact with people? Like we need to contact uh, some vendors. We need to contact some of the media uh, that we work with that publicize the plant sale. Uh, we need some people that will uh, do some administrative things on documents. Uh, we have, um, uh, Julie has been out working uh, the, the markets, the farmers markets and various other places, uh, putting up posters, passing out flyers and so forth. If you'd like to do that, if you're the kind of person that wants to get out and meet people and just kind of give me an idea of what you would like to do and what you don't want to do. You know, I don't like to do this. So don't, don't, uh, that'll help me. Okay. So it's one VP dot Nuasis MG at gmail.com. And I will forward your, information and uh, willingness to work to the appropriate uh, person. Good question. Great, thank you. Okay, for CEUs, check Kevin's email that she, he sends out daily. If you do any of those online, they are, they are, they are accountable towards your CEUs. Okay, remember, when you get the six CEUs, you don't need more than six. That's all the state will accept. 
So the rest you will put onto other projects and count it towards your volunteer hours. Any questions? All right, we'll see you on Wednesday. Have a good one. Thank you again, Josh. We really appreciate it. So long, Tim. Hello, Rebecca. I see everybody waving. It's got video. <laughs>